Chapter 7. I can't sleep. All that sleep has been sucked right out of me. Now my brain is buzzing in and out remembering what happened. Remembering Beaver. Remembering that I didn't ask for a story. I have to ask for a story. Every night. That's the rule. There are some rules that no one has to say. There are some rules you just know. But I didn't ask. I want to wake Ma to ask her to say the word so it's done and we're safe. So she remembers to think on her stories while she sleeps. So she holds on to the good. So she remembers Ba. So she tells again how he's coming, even if she just tells it in her head and not out loud. I can feel the panic sticking in my throat and crawling along my skin, and my brain is telling me to calm down because they're just words, and I want to wake her but I can't because then tomorrow will definitely be a tired day. I sit up in bed and look around, but no one else is awake. I can tell by the still and heavy in the tent. The Shakespeare duck tells me he's awake, but I tell him he doesn't count because his eyes can't e actually ever shut. Rude, he says back and puffs himself up. Usually when the jackets shine their torches around the tents, there are just as many eyes glinting back as not. After a bit the jackets go and play cards and drink their drink and don't bother too much except to come and wake us to check our IDs if they're bored or angry or just want to mess about. But the nights when the night sea comes belong just to me. And tonight, the thick quiet in the tent starts my brain wondering if maybe the night sea is on its way. I told Ma about this once when I was little, and she said it made sense. Ma reckoned that my night sea must pull everyone else's waking in on its currents and wash back deep sleep, nice and pure. Ma says it's because I listen to the earth. She says if everyone would listen to the stories deep down inside the earth, we would hear the whisperings of everything there is to hear. And if everyone did that, then just maybe we wouldn't all get stuck so much. Usually thinking on that helps me to get to sleep. And then I don't know if the sea I'm hearing is the real night sea or just the one in my dreams. But tonight I can already hear the water lapping at the tent's edge. And maybe, maybe the night sea will make it all right that I didn't ask. Maybe the night sea will make it okay, what happened with Beaver. Maybe the night sea will show me how to get Ma to wake up again properly, so we can play jacks and she can let me win, or draw memory cards, or make stick gardens, or tell jokes. Maybe I will get to see Eli's whale, as old as the universe and as big as a country, sing its song to the moon. I can hear those waves now, and suddenly I want that sea to float me up, to cover me in its waves and show me everything there is to see. And right now I need that water. I grab the duck and crawl out from under Queenie and tow over the bunks, trying not to frighten the rats scuttling about. I push through the flap as quiet as I can. But there's no sea, not even a puddle, just the wind blowing the top of the dirt to swirling, like it does sometimes, and right in the middle of the swirl, right outside my tent, right in front of me, is a girl. Like that red dirt had up and whooshed her straight from the ground, Where's the sea? The duck says. You promised me a sea. I never said promise. What I said was, and then I shake my head and shove the duck in my pocket so that the girl doesn't think I'm totally bonkers talking to a rubber duck. The girl is just standing watching me. I rub my eyes because what they're seeing can't make sense in my brain, but the rubbing doesn't change a thing. There she is, just a girl standing right there and breathing in the night air. That girl, she isn't one of us. I can ju tell just from looking. None of us has hair like that, like a fire burning up from her head and frizz straight out to the sky. None of us, excepting me and Eli, has shoes, but that girl does. She has a backpack too, and she's holding a book, a real book. Then the girl leans down and pushes her hand deep into the dirt, like she's feeling for a heartbeat. I wonder if she listens to the earth too. She looks at me and smiles. Ma used to tell me about my great, great, great ba from way back. He only had one foot, but he used to travel all over healing everyone. Ma said he had a guardian angel, except the way she said it was, he have luck wings, but it go same as his foot. Oi, someday, Suppy, luck wings comes back. Then we all be happy in luck again. Queenie and I would laugh and Ma would laugh too and none of us would know for real whether we were laughing about a lost guardian angel coming all the way to the bum end of nowhere to find us or the way Ma talked all out of whack and tried to be serious. But when I see that girl, my brain jumps to thinking about our guardian angel and for a moment, a long moment, I get to thinking that maybe that girl is our guardian angel. Even though it seems kind of strange that a guardian angel would wear trousers with more holes all over than mine even, and a shirt that is way too big, 
that maybe that's to hide the wings, which are a definite must for any guardian angel worth their salt. Then that girl hocks up the biggest ball of snot I've ever seen, and I've seen some pretty big balls of snot being hocked around here, and she spits that snot right onto the ground. That's when I know. Guardian angels don't hock up snot. That girl and I watch each other for a while, and then she shrugs, a quick shrug, like she's been talking that whole time and has finally run out of things to say. I think she must be about to go. Her body turns away and she looks out into the dark. Then she stops, like she's remembered. Do you not have any bikes in here? I shake my head. I remember the stories Eli told me about his bike, which was black and how he used to ride it to school and to his grandma's house, and that when he was riding it down a big hill, it made him feel like he was riding on the wind itself. Every time he told it, I tried to imagine what it would feel like to ride the wind, but no matter how many different ways Eli told it, it never really felt real. But maybe I haven't heard that girl right, because a bike wouldn't work in here. There are too many fences and tents in the way and not even a single hill. Huh? I, she says, I knew Max was lying. So what's your name then? Suppy, what's yours? The girl doesn't answer. Is that your book, I ask? And wish I hadn't because I know all the books in here and that isn't one of them and who else's would it be? Of course it is. Why? Can you read? I nod so fast that my head starts to aching again. Hmm, the girl says whispering something so soft to herself that I'm pretty sure I wasn't meant to hear it. Then she turns and walks into the shadows, her arms banging against her legs. See ya, she says, and I want to call out to her, to tell her to wait, because there is something about that girl that is like no one else I've ever met, like no one I've ever even thought of. But no matter how hard my eyes search those shadows, it is only her voice that is left, like she's up and turned invisible right there in front of me. It isn't until I've been sitting there for a long time. After that, I hear a quacking coming from my trousers. When I pull out the Shakespeare duck, he looks at me and says, She didn't even tell you her name.